All right, we good. We got a quorum. Right there. All right. Okay, I I detect a quorum. Civil Justice Committee is in session. You know, Clark, please call the roll. Representatives Bricken, Clemens, Curcio, Eldridge, Here. Farmer, Here. Garrett, Here. Gillespie, Here. Griffey, Here. Harris, Here. Littleton, Here. Ogles, Parkinson, Here. Ramsey, Smith, Here. Stewart, Vice Chairman Jernigan, Here. Chairman Carter. Mr. Vice Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you so much. Are there any uh, personal orders from the members? Seeing none, I, I have to say I've been on a lot of committees since we started, and I don't think there's hardly any personal orders anymore. There's no days on the hill, and so I think we should probably start recognizing lobbyists that live in our district. <laughs> that's what. Uh, that's <laughs> the objection. That's what. That's good. Um, also, want to make an announcement. If you want to put your bills on notice for civil justice in our subcommittee system you need to do that by next wednesday because we'll, they'll be closing but with that announcement we do have a calendar and we will start with item number one by chairman farmer Got a motion and a second on House Joint Resolution 132. Chairman, you're recognized. Yeah, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, what this does, House Joint Resolution 132, it, uh, it attempts to appoint James Haltom to the Middle Tennessee District of the Claims Commission. Is Mr. Haltom here? I am. Yes, sir. Good. I'm actually, I'm actually walk down there real quick. Is that okay if I present from down there? Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> Chairman right, Farmer, right. you recognize? Yeah, thank you, members. I want to come down here since Mr. Halton was present. This this is a big deal. This this man right here is well qualified. He uh, he served in our military. He was a uh, uh, he uh, he was a platoon leader in the support in in, in Iraq. He's had over 200 combat missions. Uh, following military service, he went to law school. Uh, lived down in Mississippi. He won't hold that against you. But it uh, looked like he, he was well achieved there. Uh, Mississippi Journal, Law Journal, Moot Court Board. After that, he came to Nashville. He's been a member of Burr Foreman. Now he's a partner in Nelson Mullins. And that uh, he's, he's a member of various civic organizations, uh, the Andrew Jackson Foundation, National Guard Association in Tennessee, Insurance and Trust, Better Business Bureau of Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky, and Operation Stand Down Tennessee. Uh, he's currently a colonel in the Tennessee Army National Guard and is a recent graduate of the U.S. Army's Command and General Staff. So I'd like to present Mr. Halton. If you have any questions for him, this is Gov Governor Lee's nominee for Claims Commissioner in the Middle District, and I would, I would move passage of this. Vice Chair Brickin, you recognized? I wasn't going to say anything, but I asked my colleague if he knew what the Claims Commission did, and he didn't, I don't. So um, would you just please share the, what the Claims Commission does? Certainly. Uh, yeah. Chairman, I need to go out of session to hear from him. That's yeah, maybe may go out of session. Yep. No, going out of session? Questions. Certainly glad to, I'm going to take this off. That's okay. Yeah. Certainly glad to explain the Claims Commission. Uh, it is the uh, least known court in Tennessee. Uh, many years ago, the state legislature uh, created this uh, Claims Commission as a statutory tribunal uh, which sits as a court to hear lawsuits against the state of Tennessee. Uh, the court has a, a couple primary functions. It's the uh, uh, court that hears all the state workers' compensation claims. Uh, it is the court that hears all breach of contract claims against the state of Tennessee. Uh, we hear any tort or... Uh, personal injury liability claims, so if someone is injured on state property, uh, then they can file a claim, and if it's uh, disputed, it will come to the court. Uh, we also hear the prisoner claims, so if there's a, someone who's incarcerated in, in a state facility and they file a claim, uh, it ends up in our court. Uh, in addition, uh, the state has the uh, Criminal Injuries Compensation Act, which uh, helps innocent victims of violent crimes uh, to offset their medical expenses. 
any uh, claims that are denied or the Department of Claims Risk Management is unable to make a decision, those come to our uh, tribunal as well. Uh, so it's one of the uh, ways that citizens interact with a uh, court system. It's specifically designed uh, to apply the statutory caps, which the legislature has, has put into place. Um, and there's three grand divisions. So each uh, grand division of Tennessee has um, one claims commissioner who sits for that, uh, that division. Thank Certainly, thank you. Representative Griffey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilor Haltom, uh, let me ask you this. Are you by any chance uh, related to my good friend, the attorney down in Memphis, Bill Haltom? Uh, Bill and I have tried to figure out how far back we are related. I think it's about six generations back. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, he's, he's a good person, and uh, he and I occasionally will, will email, just catch up on, on very distant family matters. Well, th thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> being a graduate of University of Mississippi and University of Mississippi Law School and having uh, practice with uh, the Attorney General's office in front of the Claims Commission representing the state, state officers, uh, I'm glad that someone has... Uh, enlighten everybody else to what that important court does yep. and I know you'll do a fine job and we're thrilled with the governor's appointment of you for this important position. Certainly. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Colonel Haltman, I'm sure the Haltman clan is strong. <laughs> um, Parks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Colonel. I just want to tell you thank you for your service also. Uh, you know, I'm a service member also. Uh, and But they, they didn't mention what your original branch was. Was it Army also? Uh, Army, I'm uh, currently the deputy commander of the 30th Troop Command in Tennessee. It's a 1600 soldier unit, and uh, we've been doing a lot of the COVID-related and responses. Um, so uh, it's been a little bit of, of a challenge to juggle both, but it's been, it's been an honor to serve. That's, that's awesome. Did you did you always were did you go in um, it, as an officer or did you go in enlisted in? in uh, I enlisted Roberta? immediately after 9/11. Then uh, received a commission in May of 2003, uh, and then uh, was a combat veteran before I went back to law school. So I've remained an infantry officer. I've never transitioned to the, the JAG Corps. Um, so coming up on 20 years, uh, it's hard to believe I'm almost eligible for retirement, but. Uh, Right. It's been good. Right. And, look, and, and you look like you're about 19, just, well, just for the record. You know. <laughs> yeah, but, but I just want, you know, to, to thank you for your service, and, and, and I look forward to your confirmation, man. Thank you for everything Certainly that you've done. Thank you. Yeah. Representative Clemens. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I just wanted to say, you know, we have the honor of serving with a man by the name of John Mark Wendell. He serves with the, in the Tennessee National Guard. So just with all the full immunity that this committee can grant, feel free to give us any true opinions about John Mark Wendell or uh, <laughs> tell us any stories you might have about him. This is your one opportunity. <laughs> um, at the discretion of the tribunal, I'll... Uh, yeah. I'll <laughs> it's been an honor to serve with him. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a smart answer. Thanks. Yeah. Representative Stewart. Yeah, I know uh, a little bit about some of your service. I know it was in very high hazardous conditions. Uh, those are real combat missions, so we really appreciate it. appreciate your service, and I, I think um, I imagine your experience as a platoon leader will, will very much help inform your decision-making uh, with all these uh, citizens that come before you. So I, I'm glad to see that you're being appointed. Certainly. Thank you. Any further questions for our guest? Chairman Curcio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I just I just want to echo what a lot of folks have said, but I think you and I might have been on campus about the same time at Ole Miss, uh, and um, anyway, just very impressed by your background and appreciate your willingness to serve, and uh, I, too, am good friends with Bill and Claudia Haltham down in Shelby County, and um, so anyway, just w well done all around, and, and thank you for being such a great candidate. Sure, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, we'll go back into session. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members, and it's my honor and pleasure to present to you Mr. James Haltham for consideration for uh, Claims Commission of the Middle District. I'd move passage. Second. Question has been called on the bill. We'll be voting on House Joint Resolution 132 to go to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. Off to calendar and rules. Congratulations. <laughs> members going to item number two which is House Bill 874 by Chairman Terry. Oh. 
Got a motion and a second on the bill. We do have an amendment, I believe, 5154. Is that, that correct? That's correct. We have a first and a second on the amendment. Uh, Chairman, would like to explain the amendment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, what this amendment does, it requires a caseworker to document any objection to a child's placement with relative by another relative or an interested party. And secondly, uh, the information will be added to the annual report on foster care. Got up. Uh, Representative Griffey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman, for bringing this legislation. I think it's really smart. Uh, one of the biggest complaints I hear is when there's a relative that wants to take a child, and then for whatever reason, DCS puts the child in foster care, and we need to keep ch children uh, with their family members to the greatest extent possible. So thank you for bringing this. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the comments. And uh, this uh, issue was brought to, to me, and I sat down with DCS, and we worked with them on, on the amendment. So thank you. Any other questions on the amendment? We'll be voting to put the amendment on to uh, House Bill 874. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. We're now on 874 as amended. Chairman, did the amendment make the bill? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The amendment made the bill. Any further questions? The question has been called. We're now voting on House Bill 874 to go to calendar rules. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Chairman, you're off the calendar and rules. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. I would like to say, uh, first time I've been in front of you as a chairman, and it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, item number three, House Bill 159 by Chairman Williams has been rolled one week. <laughs> item number four, House Bill 1371 by Chairman Halsey. Do I have a motion and a second? Motion. I have a motion and a second. It's uh, properly before us. Uh, Chairman Holsey, you were recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, committee. And Mr. Chairman, I've, I've uh, uh, rode you in the past a little bit, uh, and gigged you quite a bit. I hope you'll forgive you me of that, that now, now and, and overlook all that. <laughs> <laughs> House Bill 1371, a couple of years ago, we passed a bill saying that legislators can solemnize marriage, and this bill just adds notaries public to that group who can solemnize marriages in Tennessee. Mayor, you have the explanation. Any questions for the chairman? Seeing none, we're going to be voting on House Bill 1371 to go to counter and rules. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. Chairman? Thank you. Committee and chairman. All right. Members, uh, on all these bills, if you have a no vote, just please tell the clerk. Item number five, House Bill 961 by Chairman Whitson. I have a motion in the second. It's probably before us. Chairman Whitson, it's a pleasure to see you today, sir. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. And it's, it's a great honor to address you as chairman, my good friend. Oh, thank you. It's... Um, <laughs> The intent of this legislation is to provide law enforcement officers immunity from suit while making an arrest outside their jurisdiction. To qualify for immunity from suit, the officer must meet the following conditions. The law enforcement officer must be post certified. The law enforcement officer must be authorized to make arrests as a full-time employee of a Tennessee county, municipality, or metropolitan form of government. For felony arrest outside an officer's jurisdiction, the officer must witness and reasonably believe that a person committed a felony or is committing a felony. For misdemeanors that amount to a breach of peace, the officer making the arrest outside their, their jurisdiction must witness that a person is in the process of committing such an act. Protection from suit is also offered to officers rendering assistance to law enforcement officers in, of this state in an emergency or at the request of the officer. And what this actually means is there's parts of Williamson County that an officer from Metro must travel th through to get to uh, a Davidson County address. So this gives them the same protection as they would have in Davidson County while they, if they witness an offense, a felony offense in Williamson County. With that, Mr. Chairman, I renew my motion. Mr. Chairman, you, you have listed some folks to speak, is that right? Uh, yes, if I'm asked a question, I can't answer. Oh, so they, okay. <laughs> Use their own reserve, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, 
Representative Stewart. I'm sorry, Representative Gillespie, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have any problem with this. I just got a couple questions for you. Sure. Um, so would this apply to a uh, post-certified officer that works for a college or a um, some other state entity? Mr. Chairman, request to go out of session. And <laughs> <laughs> We're out of session. Who would you like to come up? I would like to ask the just, uh, Captain O'Neill from the Brentwood Police Department. Captain O'Neill. Oh, yeah. Captain O'Neill, you're recognized, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, the, to answer your question, this does not apply to college law enforcement, and it wouldn't apply to state law enforcement because they already have that authority throughout the state. Thank you. Let me... Go ahead, follow up. Sorry. Um, so I just want to... Sorry, I'm getting to the weeds here a little bit. I apologize. So, like, for instance, the University of Memphis Police Department, if they are off campus, across the street, this would not apply to that? No, they, they already have specific statutes that, that cover those type of situations okay. for them that's just for sp specifically for campus. For okay, officers. thank you so much. Representative Stewart for the captain. Yeah, and, and it, this may be for the sponsor, just, it sounds like there's not, and it looks like there's no expansion of the type of immunity available. It's just all we're doing is, ex is expanding the geographic application of the existing immunity. So for example, you have immunity for certain actions you take in your jurisdiction. We're not expanding the nature of that by this bill. We're just saying that if you're moving from county to county, you, you travel with the immunity. Is that fair? That's correct. Thank you. Representative Griffin. Thank you, Cap. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Captain O'Neill, for your service to the safety of Tennesseans, and I appreciate this bill. And let me ask you, is this, this legislation going to be better for you and law enforcement for citizens and, and help protect safety for citizens in the state of Tennessee? Absolutely. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, we'll go back out of session. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman I renew my motion. He's renewed his motion. Any questions for the chairman? Questions have been called. All those in favor of House Bill 961 going to uh, calendar and rules. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Calendar and rules. Like thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, committee. Now I'm to item number six, House Bill 323 by Representative Hodges. And a motion and a second. I have a motion and a second. The bill is properly before us. Representative Hodges, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this, this stems from a case that happened in my district where uh, two 13-year-old boys held down a 14-year-old girl, uh, raped her for about an hour, um, video recorded it, went to court and, um, uh, you know, laughed at the victim and, and giggled throughout the process, um, were found guilty and put on probation. Um, because there was nothing more the judge could do because they're 13 years old, not 14 years old. So this would allow the judge to to put them in DCS custody. Um, and, and, you know, just to take it a step further, these, these kids, just to let you know, when they were on probation, the next day they were going to be on the same school bus as the girl they had raped. Um, luckily, our school district sent a separate bus. But just, just know that school districts that don't have those resources <laughs> might have been in a situation where, where two rapists were, were on a, the same school bus as their victim, um, the, the girl that they had tortured. So um, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. I guess you heard the explanation. Members, any questions? Chairman Curcio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I just want to point out, as heinous as that is, that they would be on the school bus with a girl that they raped, there were also two rapists on a school bus. Is that, is that correct? <laughs> That's correct, That's yes. True. Wow. Thank you for the bill. Representative Griffey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for bringing this legislation. I'm, I'd like to sign on to it if you'd let me. So thank you. Great. Uh, Chair Lady Milton. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you for bringing this bill. And I hope that they get some extensive therapy because they're, they're, they're not well to do something like that and not being punished. They've just been encouraged to continue their situation. 
Thank you. And thank you for all your support on this bill as well, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions? Question on the bill. And, uh, okay, the question has been called without objection. We'll be voting on House Bill 323 to go to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Representative, I'm, you might want to send around a sign on sheet to some personal that that's a good bill. Okay. Uh, item number seven, House Bill 899 by, uh, I'm sorry, but Chairman Doggett has been rolled two weeks by the sponsor's request. Uh, item number eight, House Bill 661 by Representative Manis. We have a motion and a second. The bill's properly before us. Representative, you're recognized. Chair, I just want you to know that you're one of my favorite committee chairs. <laughs> is, there, is there a joke going around here? I don't, okay. I feel like I'm being punked. I'm being punked or something. Okay. I said one of my favorite committee okay, chairs. Okay, one. Uh, yeah. And I'm glad to see my uh, two freshman colleagues here from the best <laughs> class ever. So. Uh, members, this is House Bill 661, and this legislation simply makes government work more efficiently by removing a statutory requirement for a duplicative audit by the Comptroller's Office. This was brought to me by the Comptroller's Office. The current law requires the Comptroller's Office to complete an annual audit of a portion of the handgun permit application fee that is appropriated to the TBI. The Comptroller's Office routinely audits the TBI during the sunset performance cycle as well. It is more efficient for the Comptroller's Office to audit the handgun permit application fee during the sunset cycle than every year. The audit of this fee, again, is duplicative and it can be audited during the, the sunset audit process. The funds, obviously, will still be reconciled and accounted for on an annual basis. So with that, I will entertain any questions. Members, you have the explanation. Are there any questions? Seeing none, we'll be voting on House Bill 661 to go to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Off the calendar and rules. Thank you. Stay right there, sir. Item number nine, House Bill 944. Second. By Representative Manis, you have a you have a motion and a second. The bill's probably before us. Thank you. Representative, you're recognized. Thank you very much. Members, House Bill 944 simply seeks to unify the code by deleting TCA 8-21-409 that is written and it only applies to two fee-based court systems in Knoxville. Uh, these two courts are the only ones out of the 95 counties to have a different fee structure. House Bill 944 would put these courts in line with the rest of the state and would also have a positive impact on court fees with these two local courts. Uh, for some reason, this exclusion was made in 2005 and this legislation was brought to me by the Clerk of Master of the Knox County Chancery Court and also the Honorable Charles Susano III, Knox County Circuit Civil Sessions, and Juvenile Court Clerk. So I'll entertain any questions. Representative Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for representing bringing this. And uh, look, I, in sub, I was uh, opposed to this because I'm not in favor on increasing court costs on any of our litigants. I honestly, I kind of feel like they're too high already. But let me ask you this. Are these two courts, are they the only two courts in Tennessee that their fees are lower than everybody else's? The only two courts. Okay. If their fees are lower and they're not on par with everybody else, I can support your legislation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Representative, the question's been called. Without objection, we'll be voting on House Bill 944 to go to finance sub. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Finance sub, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee. Item number 10, House Bill 699, by Representative Campbell. Is it? No. Representative, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. House Bill 699 was requested by the Johnson County, Tennessee Commission. They uh, would like to employ a full-time general sessions judge for Johnson County and uh, pro this would prohibit the judge from practicing law or accepting other employment upon adoption of a resolution by two-thirds majority vote of the county legislative body. The current judge is part-time. Thank you. Members, you heard the explanation. Any questions? Questions have been called. Um, 
Without objection, we're going to be voting on House Bill 699 to go to finance sub. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Finance Thank you, sub. Mr. Chairman and members. Members on uh, item number 11, House Bill 640 by Representative Alexander. I don't see her here. We're going to roll that to the heel of the calendar. Item 12. House Bill 1166 by Representative Harris. Motion. Got a motion and a second. Uh, Representative, we have an amendment on this, 4451. Is that correct? That, that's correct. We have a motion and a second on the amendment. And uh, Representative Harris, you are recognizing the amendment. Thank you so much. Uh, and this amendment makes the bill. Uh, and to uh, all the chairmen that sit on this committee, as well as this amazing chairman right here, oh you are my favorites. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so HB 1166 is the foster youth siblings bill um, and so with this one it would require a foster care agency to provide contact information to siblings who are also in foster care but live in separate homes if doing so is in the best interest of each child and if the children so choose to communicate. Um, I have two minor constituents who were separated in DCS and placed in separate homes and DCS does a pretty good job trying to ensure that they try to place siblings together as best as they can, but um, this does um, often happen sometimes. In this case, these two siblings had contact information for each other, but one foster parent would take away calling privileges as a form of punishment if chores around the house were not completed timely or if something happened at school or just when the foster parent was upset about something. Um, this bill would also establish that a child in foster care cannot be punished by restricting and holding contact information um, for a sibling. Um, surprisingly enough, when I presented this language to members in my community, I got feedback from many who were um, once in foster care and at one time or another who said either this was definitely something that was needed or that they had experienced this when they were under foster care. Um, this doesn't stop a foster parent from setting hours for when a person can talk to someone, but um, it does it does limit them from being able to use it as a form of punishment. Um, and so with that, I turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much, Representative. Uh, any questions for Representative Harris? That's my amendment. Uh, there's a question on the amendment to put on, the amendment to put on House Bill 1166. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed, ayes have it. We're now on the bills amended. I think you said it made the bill. Absolutely. Any questions on the bills amended? Seeing none, we'll be voting on House Bill 1166 as amended to go to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. We're on to calendar and rules, sir. Thank you, committee. Uh, item number 13 by Chair Lady Littleton. Second. Uh, House Bill 389 has a first and a second. It's probably before us. Uh, Chair Lady, you have an amendment, 4174? Motion on amendment. That's quick. We have a motion to second on the amendment. Does the amendment make the bill? The amendment makes the bill. Well, let's go ahead and move the amendment and put it on the bill. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. The bill is amended. Would you like to explain it, please? Uh, the bill says by July 1st of, of 2022 requires any person receiving federal or state funded adoption assistance from the Department of Children's Services to annually provide DCS with medical records from the adopted child's annual physical examination or a similar documentation from a medical or mental health professional or verification of full-time school enrollment from the school the child attends. It authorizes DCS to initiate a visit to ascer uh, sorry, get it all tongue -tied. Yeah, the well-being of the child if the person fails to provide the required documentation. And I'd like to, with your permission, to read a little bit of the new story of where this came from. If that's yeah, okay. you recognize. Thank you. I think the update is authorities discovered a second child's remains outside the home and halls that is owned by the adult son of Michael Gray Sr. and Shirley Gray. So this is the previous story. An East Tennessee husband and wife are charged with locking children in their basement, giving them little food and water, and burying a girl in their backyard after she died. Michael Anthony Gray Sr., 63, and his wife Shirley Ann Gray, 60, faced charges in a horrific child abuse case involving at least four children 
of their non-biological children. The couple faced two counts of aggravated child abuse, two counts of especially aggravated kidnapping, three counts of aggravated child neglect, and one count of abuse of, a, of the courts. The investigation began the evening of May 22nd when Pastor Bias told authorities they found a child walking alone along the road on Gray's family's, uh, at Gray's family's home. The Roan County Sheriff's deputies responded, found the boy, and learned that he lived at the Gray's home. The Gray's moved into the home with their four minor children of whom they had legal custody in June of 2016. Deputies took the boy home and called the Tennessee Department of Children's Services. Michael Gray Sr. then traveled to the department's office in Kingston and told officials he had a 15-year-old child in his basement and that another child was buried in the backyard, according to the warrants. The entire house smelt of urine, feces, and deputies wrote as they wrote the arrest warrants. The basement where the children were was unfinished and partially flooded. It lacked electricity and running water. It had no bathroom and it was full of human and animal feces. And one cage contained a guinea pig and as well as garbage, mold, and exposed wires. A 15-year-old, the oldest of the four children, was still in the basement and apparently had been kept there for four years. He was locked in the basement in 2016 as punishment for stealing food from the pantry and refrigerator according to the warrant. He was given only bread and water. In early 2017, a girl who was about 11 was locked in the basement also as punishment for stealing food. She died within a few months after being given only bread and water according to the warrants. Michael Gray Sr. said that he kept the girl's body in a cardboard box and later buried it in a pole barn in the backyard. Deputies found human bones there early uh, May the 23rd, and the remains were taken to the Knox County Forensic Center for an autopsy. At least one of the other children periodically was kept inside a wire cage in the basement before the Grays built a small concrete room measuring less than three uh, feet by four feet under the stairs for confinement, according to the arrest warrants. The warrants are based largely on interview conducted over two and a half days with the three surviving children of the Grays both who repeatedly waived their rights to remain silent. The three surviving children were taken into custody of the Tennessee Department of Children's Services. Authorities say they have not released much information about the condition of the children. Two are boys and a third girls. Deputies wrote in the warrants that the children appear to be stunted in growth and none of them have received medical attention in at least six years. Shirley Gray, who was fully aware of the conditions the children lived in, according to the warrants, claimed the children were homeschooled. Two of the children appear, appear to have no formal education, according to the warrants, and were in fact amazed when the refrigerator, what a refrigerator does when observed when they open the door. So that's where this bill came from. So it's not even, I guess one bad apple might spoil the whole bunch, but this is the most horrific case that we could ever imagine could happen to these children. It's absolutely stunning. Um, members, any, any questions for Chairlady Littleton? Questions. Questions have been called without objection. We'll be voting on House Bill 389 as amended to go to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. It's ready to move on. Thank you. Chairlady, you also have item 14, which is House Bill 417. <laughs> Have a motion to the second. The bill's before us. I have two amendments on here. Which amendment would you like to do I, I first? I want to go with 5398 that rewrites the bill, please. Okay, so 5398 uh, rewrites the bill. And let, let's put the amendment on the bill. Second. Um, I have a motion to the second for free at 5398. Uh, question's been called without objection. We'll be voting on House Bill, I mean, uh, House Amendment 5398 to go on the bill 417. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. The bill as amended, Chair Lady Littleton, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this bill says uh, it becomes severe child abuse if knowingly allowing a child to be within a structure where any of the following controlled substances are present and accessible to the child. And it's any Schedule I controlled substance, cocaine, meth, and fentanyl. 
I'm here to the explanation. Are there any questions? Questions question have been called. Without objection, we'll be voting on House Bill 417 is amended to go to finance sub. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. We are off to finance sub. I have number 15, House Bill 1186 by Representative Garrett. You do have an amendment, sir? Four, yep. Four, 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 five, five. That's right, Mr. Chairman. That's correct. We have a, a motion and a second on the amendment. Does the amendment make the bill? Yes, it does. Let's put the amendment on the bill. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have it. Uh, Representative Garrett, you are recognized on 1186 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> it's part of my law practice. I, I practice probate and estate planning, and um, the Tennessee Bankers Association and I have worked very, very hard on making our, our trust legislation uh, the best that it can be. In fact, this legislation uh, passed the House floor last time uh, unanimously and got coveted up in the Senate, so it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. Um, so this is pretty much 98% identical. What we've changed it into some dates since we're now about a year later, so it's uh, w one thing that I'd like to note um, is that over the past five years, where we had $25 billion in trust here in the state of Tennessee, that has jumped to $125 billion, and it's, well, because of this General Assembly and our laws that, that are, are people coming here because our laws are so good to both beneficiaries, trustees, and grantors who make the trust, and believe it or not, we don't have a lot of litigation that's resulting in our uh, trust legislation. So that's why people like to come here and have their have their money here, which creates jobs, et cetera. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to take uh, any questions uh, on this very short uh, bill uh, right. if the committee should just have, have some. <laughs> Are there any questions for uh, this 13-page bill that, <laughs> that a representative has? Call the, call the question has been called. Uh, without objection, we'll be voting on House Bill 1186 to go to finance sub. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. We go to finance sub. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. Representative, you have item number 16 as well, which is uh, House Bill 1196. You have a motion second. and a second. Uh, you do have an amendment, 5387, is that correct? Yes, 5387. Does the um, have a motion and second on the amendment? Does it make the bill? Uh, no, it actually oh, does not. Okay, well, let's hear the amendment. Sure. Um, this amendment was drafted and helped uh, by the Tennessee Bar Association. <clears throat> it is Section C. It says this section applies only to civil actions brought solely against the entities or one of the entities specified in Subdivision A3, which again goes to the original amendment, so I'll be happy to kind of explain that as a whole, but this amendment was brought to me by the Bar Association in order to clarify a potential issue that this bill could create. Members, any questions on the amendment? Seeing none, we'll put the amendment on House Bill 1196. And, and let me, and actually, okay. I, I thought the amendment only applied to this, but I'm being told by legal that it actually makes the full bill. So they must have rewrote the bill when they added this language. So I wanted to make sure. You try to pull a fast one? That I must have, yeah, un, un, unbeknownst to myself. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I so, got you. So I can explain the entire okay. bill uh, if, if that's okay with the chair. The amendment makes the bill, so we'll be voting on um, Amendment 5387 to go on to 1196. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, I have it. Uh, Representative Garrett, the bill as amended, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the uh, clarification on that. What this, uh, what this does is establish venue. Right now, in the state of Tennessee, if a plaintiff wants to challenge a state statute for constitutional purposes, those matters are referred to by statute to the Davidson County Courts here. What this statute does is if anybody in your particular district, in your particular county, wants to challenge a state statute based upon unconstitutional reasons, they can file that lawsuit within their own county and be heard by their own judges uh, at the judges that they, that they elected in their respective county. With that, I'll be glad to take any questions. Representatives, you have heard the explanation. Are there any questions? Okay. Representative Stewart. Well, why the change? H haven't we done this the same way for about a hundred years? What's the, what's the rush to, or what what leads to this proposal? Well, I'm not sure what we've done for the past hundred years, but a client of mine uh, that was in West Tennessee that had an issue he wanted to sue the state on, and I did a little bit of research on this particular matter and realized that 
he had to come all the way to Nashville and file that lawsuit. And so if you are going to challenge uh, any sort of state constitutional purpose for whatever reason you would like, I don't believe it's fair for that plaintiff to actually have to travel here to Nashville and have that lawsuit filed. That should be able to, that matter should be able to be filed within their county and heard by the elected official that they elected uh, to, that, to that bench. So it doesn't take the right, <clears throat> excuse me, of a Davidson County resident uh, if they want to file this particular lawsuit, they can certainly file that lawsuit in their home county here in Davidson County. But the reason the reason we have it set up the way we do, isn't it, is that the attorney general is here, and the idea is we're trying to create a consistent body of constitutional law. So we have the same judges here, these constitutional arguments over and over again. I think that's why we've done it this way. What do you think about that policy? It seems like this is a, a pretty significant departure from the way things have been done in Tennessee for many, many years. And I think that that happens in every case. You have a car wreck case, the same car wreck case can be filed in Shelby County just like it can be filed in Knox County. And if we have two different judges that have two different opinions, that's why we have the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court to clarify whatever rulings they have. So I don't think this is that much of a departure uh, given that any other <clears throat> particular matter someone wants to file, they certainly have that right to file uh, in their county uh, where they live. So I don't think that this is much of a departure. So I would respectfully disagree with that comment. Well, just, just to be clear, I haven't mischaracterized the way the law has worked, right? Right now, constitutional matters, which of course go beyond a car wreck, they're defining what our constitution of our state means. They are directed to a single county, the county where the attorney general has his offices, so that, so <coughs> that uh, the same judges hear these important constitutional matters and the Attorney General, who, as you know, has to be noticed any time uh, a constitutional challenge is made to any statute, the Attorney General uh, is able very quickly to weigh in. I mean, isn't that why we have this whole structure set up? It seems to me you're, you're upending a system we've had in place for many, many years, certainly <coughs> since I graduated from law school, which unfortunately was quite some time ago. I appreciate the question, and um, what I'm interpreting by that is we have a Davidson County judges that are only judges that can hear and decide upon constitutional matters and I believe any judge in this state across the state that's duly elected as a judge has the ability to rule on all matters before the judge and every plaintiff in Tennessee and in this state should be able to bring that lawsuit in the county where they live instead of come to Nashville when that's a possibility. I know we have a lot of members. One more question. Do you know, you said the uh, Bar Association brought you this amendment. Are they now in support of this bill? Or do they have an opinion on this bill? I can't say. I don't, I don't know if they're in support. I think they're neutral. But the fact that I worked with them on this and they were involved in the drafting of that amendment, I would say that they're probably going to remain neutral so they're not opposed to this legislation. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Representative Clemens. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I've got serious concerns about us codifying forum shopping in constitutional cases. Um, so what happens when, let's say, you know, like last year, somebody wants to challenge the constitutionality of our voter absentee uh, mail-in balloting laws. 95 different counties, 95 different lawsuits, voters in every one of those counties bring a claim. You got 95 potentially different opinions, give or take a few, based on multi-county districts. You're going to get all those different responses, all those different rulings. How is that going to work realistically? Well, since you present an unrealistic scenario, that's why we have the Tennessee Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals to make those decisions uh, like it ended up in the Davidson County Chancery Court. You're not going to have, I think, lawsuits every single county. I've never seen that happen. So we are jumping to a potential scenario that will most likely never happen. Well, but it, but it can happen under this law. And if somebody wants to challenge the constitutionality of the voting statute in an election year, it is very realistic that a voter in every county who wishes to vote could challenge a statute. That is a very realistic scenario and probably would have played out last year. So you're going to have all these different rulings. 
the AG is going to be stretched off across the entire state of Tennessee. 95, you know, give or take a few notices of appeal. And then you're going to have the Supreme Court trying to filter through 95, give or take a few different rulings on this issue. Yeah, the appeals court process is there, but all those resources, that's why I have a problem with this fiscal note. You've got resources being spread across the state. The AG is going to have to have more attorneys. You're going to have to have more resources. Every department's going to spend more money. I, I, the fiscal note makes no sense. Um, I, I just am curious how you see that playing out because that is a very realistic scenario. That's why we have them centralized in one locus, one venue, so that if there is an issue, you're not creating different precedent all over the state of Tennessee. So how do you foresee that playing out logistically, realistically, and in the best interest of judicial efficiency in the state of Tennessee? Well, one, the, there is no fiscal note on this, so you continue to have a problem with the fact that there is no fiscal note uh, it, on, on this. And I mean, I'm not in a position to answer every hypothetical that you could possibly come up with in every single different, different county, but the interest of Tennesseans to be able to bring a lawsuit if you are on the outskirts of Johnson City or the outskirts of West Tennessee, the fact that we make the burden on Tennesseans rather than the burden on our court system uh, is, is unacceptable to me for a plaintiff that wants to challenge that they for a, a potential state statute that they believe is unconstitutional. They shouldn't have to, Tennesseans shouldn't have to travel to the middle of the state just because it's been that way for hundreds of years. They should have the ability to hear that matter in front of the judge that they duly elected from whatever county they come from. The state of Tennessee goes from 95 counties. We shouldn't have one county here that's a super court. I know with two super courts, the United States Supreme Court and the Tennessee, then the Tennessee Supreme Court. No other super court should exist in this state. Every county should have the ability to weigh a matter by their residents that duly elected their judges in whatever they county they came from to challenge the state statute. If we're on the same topic, one more question. I want to avoid a running debate, so okay. one more on the same question. Well, it, it's it's such an important issue because right. plaintiffs, while they may prefer to have that convenience and that may be beneficial to a plaintiff who brings a case, they also need to be able to expect consistent rulings and to be able to rely upon the ruling of their court without automatically de, de facto having to go through the appeals process. Because it's very likely you're going to get multiple rulings and the appeals process, while voluntary, is almost going to be inevitable. In, in a case where you bring cases in different jurisdictions where you could have different opposing rulings. And, and with regard to the super court, this very bill creates a super court in Sumner County for foreign plaintiffs. So how do you respond to that? Representative, would you like to respond? The idea of a out-of-state plaintiff, and again, when, when you brought this up in subcommittee, my response was, why not? Someone chose Davidson County. Uh, to hear out-of-state plaintiffs that want to challenge a statute for the Tennesseans that live here. So going, going back and forth on an idea that you are now suggesting that people should take away their rights to appeal a case to the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, that's the avenue that this can take if there are challenges or rulings that could be inconsistent. It has happened in precedent, it has happened in case law, it has happened in other cases that apply in this particular situation. So I stand by my comments. Okay. Thank you. I got Representative Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Bill Sponsor. I've just got, uh, as a non-attorney on this committee, um, relative to Tennessee Code Annotated, is it supposed to be um, administered to plaintiffs and defendants any differently in one county or the other? Representative. If I, if I understand your, your question properly, typically in a lawsuit to establish venue, it's where the defendant resides or where the action took place, okay? In this scenario, the defendant is the state of Tennessee, which I would argue is all 95 counties. So the statute tries to address this matter both for the plaintiff and for the defendant to establish where court cases can be heard, which is venue. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And back to the bill sponsor. So if, if I remember our Tennessee uh, Constitution as well as Tennessee Code annotated, counties are treated as extensions of the state. Is that not what our current law, uh, the premise around counties is an extension of our state governments. Is that correct? Representative? Yes. Yes. I'll be supporting your bill. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Griffey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, sponsor, for bringing this legislation. I think that this legislation is smart and timely. Uh, to my good friend from uh, Davidson County, um, we, we, the, the legislature kind of had given the voters and the judges of Davidson County the first bite of all constitutional issues for so many years, and that's not fair to the other citizens in other counties throughout the state of Tennessee. And this uh, legislation attempts to address that. Uh, it also shifts it. If it's been in Davidson County for 150 years or whatever it's been, let's let Sumner County be the uh, designated place to hear initial constitutional challenges. As to the issue of multiple lawsuits filed in multiple counties, <coughs> as my good friend knows, that what would happen is that the Attorney General has to be notified of any constitutional challenges. The Attorney General would go into all those various law, very, all those various courts and jurisdictions and alert the judge. There's the same or similar issues been filed in this county or that county, and typically it goes to the first county where it's filed. I know that creates sort of a rush to the courthouse, but that's sort of the system we have in America, you know, whether for good or for worse. It is what it is. And once a ruling is made by one chancellor, that ruling is supposed to be good for the state of Tennessee, and then it goes up from that chancellor to the Court of Appeals. If whichever litigant has a, uh, wants to appeal the ruling. So I, I support the legislation. Thank you for bringing it. And I look forward for passing this in this 112th General Assembly. Thank you. Uh, Representative Clemens, your name wasn't called, but I believe he was referring to you if you'd like to respond. Yeah, I just, the only thing I'd point out is that Nashville's Chancery Court wasn't arbitrarily chosen. It's because this is the seat of government and it just happens to be physically located in the middle of Tennessee. I mean, the history of that statute is the seat of government and, and in the interest of judicial efficiency. So that's all I'd like to say. Thanks. Uh, Representative Stewart. Yes, I, I just one more question for the sponsor. I just wonder if you could articulate uh, the basis for your choice of Sumner County for <coughs> your, uh, for the provision that directs all foreign plaintiffs to Sumner County. What's the basis for that? That it, that it directs all out of state plaintiffs to Sumner County right why and again that, that's been asked and answered and so I'll, I will say that again why not someone chose Davidson County there's no fiscal note so there's no reason why there's got to be this circular where we can't travel to other places from our AG's office or whomever will be defending these lawsuits and so Sumner County seemed like a a good place to start for those out-of-state out-of-state plaintiffs that try to file a lawsuit challenging a, a, a statute for constitutional purposes. There's not that many of them. So it's not like there's gonna be a huge influx going from here or there, but it, but it, is, it is where uh, this is gonna be appropriate and this is appropriate under this legislation. Yeah, and I didn't mean to, to have you repeat. I just wanna, thank you. I just wanna make sure you had every opportunity to describe every basis for your choice of Sumner County on the record. Thank you for that. Uh, Chairman Farmer. Question on the bill. A question. I do have one quick question, if you don't mind. I don't need a quick question. Okay. Previous question has been called. And, uh, we'll be, without objection, we'll be voting on 1196. House Bill 1196 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. No. Ayes have it. Moves on to counter rules, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee. We're gonna go. We're gonna go out of order since uh, Representative Alexander uh, has, has uh, is now here. So we are uh, at item number eleven, House Bill six forty. And Representative Alexander, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman, and thanks to the committee uh, who waited so patiently on me to show up. I apologize for that. I was in another meeting that. Didn't realize, and I want to thank you all the people that text me and <laughs> say, come, your bill's up. Uh, today I bring before you a, a bill that um, is, I, I feel like just a wonderful bill. 
we have, and I know everybody that stands up here feels like their bills are wonderful. That sounded pretty stupid. But um, if you go to a food pantry and you get a can of food and you go home and you eat it and you end up with salmonella poisoning, that food pantry is protected by law. This is the same way for women. We have underprivileged women all across this state. And when they are needing food, they're needing feminine hygiene products as well. And because of that, and because of toxic shock syndrome that happened so many years ago, these agencies that are giving these uh, feminine hygiene products out to these underprivileged women need protection so that people cannot sue them if something occurs. I ask that you consider this. It's a, a thing that's very needed in our area, especially with COVID when women had no money and these products are extremely expensive. They had to go to the shelters to get them. Thank you, Chairman. Members, you've heard the explanation. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to uh, thank you, uh, Representative, for bringing, bringing this bill. But I also want to mention that I had the privilege of watching her sprint down the hallway <laughs> to, get to, <laughs> to get to this committee room to be heard. Uh, but I just want to mess with you about that. But good bill. Thank you for bringing it. Thank Great you. job. Chair, yeah, Chair Lady Littleton. Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, will this include uh, teenagers as well? Yes, it does. Because we try to give to the child advocacy centers and things like that, and it's they're not allowed there either. So this will help them as well. Thank you. Members, any further questions? Thank you, Chairman. Now, Farmer. <laughs> Question on the bill. It's been uh, question has been called. Um, Without objection, we'll be voting on House Bill 640 to go to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Get off the calendar and rules. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chairman. I guess I'll still raise his hand, but it was a little bit too Thank late. Thank you, Committee. Thank you. Uh, item 17, House Bill 1303. By Vice Chairman Bricken, you have a motion and a second. You have an amendment, sir? Yes, and the amendment makes the bill, Chairman. Uh, I have a motion and a second. Is it 4650? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. We'll be voting to put Amendment 4650 on the House Bill 1303. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Um, Vice Chairman Bricken, you are recognized on 1303 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we saved the last, the best bill for last. Um, <laughs> Uh, this bill came to me last year from the County Clerks Association and also the, to, to Leader Gant, and it's basically from the clerks to uh, allow a citizen who's 75 years or older to declare to the jury coordinator or the clerk's office their mental or physical inability to serve on jury duty. And upon that action, they can be exempted from jury duty. and But I want to be sure anyone 75 years or older can serve on jury duty and are encouraged to serve on jury duty. So with that, sir, I'll take any questions. Members, you heard the explanation? Any questions? The question has been called. All those uh, in favor of House Bill 1303 as amended go into calendar and rules. I'll say aye. aye. Those opposed? Eyes have it. Vice Chairman, you're off the calendar and rules. Uh, that completes our calendar. Members, are there any announcements you'd like to make before we adjourn? Motion, Motion to adjourn. Motion. So moved. Throw out. Okay.